So our next speaker is Dr. Eric Williamson. He is a professor of radiology at Mayo Clinic, where he currently serves as associate chair for radiology informatics and supervises the radiology Art artificial intelligence program. Dr. Williamson obtained his medical degree from the Mayo Clinic Medical School and completed his radiology residency at Mayo Clinic and did a fellowship in non-invasive cardiovascular imaging at Stanford University. Dr. Williamson has a subspecialty interest in cardiac and vascular CT and cardiac MR and focusing on imaging of structural heart disease. And he also led the CT medical practice for many years, so we had the opportunity to work closely together. So thank you, Eric. Oh, thanks very much, Cynthia. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and I uh, really appreciate the, the invitation. And I'll talk just a little bit during this talk about why this invitation means so much to me personally, but, uh, but we'll get into that right away. I have no relevant disclosures uh, for the material in question, but in terms of maybe irrelevant disclosures, I should probably mention that this is not the first time that I've ever been asked to give a talk similar to this. I was asked to give this talk cardiac CT, past, present, and future, I think, I'm pretty sure, in 2006. And 2006 is an important year for, for many reasons, um, but this is, one of the, this is one of the reasons. You can see from left to right, the, this was the cardiac group. This was before we had divisions in radiology. Terry, you remember these days. These were just groups that kind of hung out together, presumably. And this was the cardiac group in those days. And the distinguished looking gentleman on the far left, Paul Jolsrud, who is a congenital heart disease specialist, and Jerry Breen, who should probably be giving this talk today, has, uh, has certainly forgotten more about cardiac CT than I will ever know. Jim Glockner in the middle, he's singled out there in blue because he's really an MRI guy, but we hang out with him anyway. And the next guy over there who looks vaguely like a terrorist, according uh, by his own admission, that's that's Dr. Phil Arouse. Hopefully you know Phil, phenomenal guy, amazing educator. And then the gentleman on the far right uh, with the dubious haircut choice that uh, I think will probably not uh, not um, not go well in the longstanding pictures. That was me. I was the junior member of the group. I had completed my fellowship in 2004. So nobody ever asked me to talk about anything in 2006, simply didn't get invited. The only way there was a trickle down to Williamson was if somebody, probably everybody on the left-hand side of this, uh, this diagram uh, turned this down. And in this case, it was Jerry Breen who was asked to give a talk about past, present, and future and would have waxed philosophic and probably given a talk that would have made a lot of sense here. And uh, unfortunately, I was tapped to go in his place. But I showed slides that day that are very similar to many of the slides that you've seen today, right? And this is, of course, the famous EMI Mark I. This is a picture that was taken, I think, with my digital camera. I think that was before I had really a very good uh, camera on my phone of the scanner, which, of course, we all know and love, and was at that point sitting in a hallway uh, one floor up from my office. It is now currently one floor down from my office. And you all know the story better than I do about uh, Dr. Hounsfield and other colleagues who, uh, who developed this machine and what it was good for. But of course, there wasn't much, frankly, that this scanner was doing in the cardiac space, right? Because different from, uh, uh, from an explant of, uh, of a breast specimen, which could be put into the gantry, as we heard this morning, uh, the heart didn't work very well that way, right? At least not, in, not, a, functional, uh, not a functional heart. But it's wrong to think that the individuals who initially started the work that was done in CT weren't thinking about the heart in any way, shape, or form. This is a cutout from a paper from 1977. One of the authors of this, as you can see, I've underlined it in red there, Godfrey Hounsfield. And this was Gated Computed Tomography of the Human Heart, 1977. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I was not graduating from high school there, but roughly middle school-ish at this point. I mean, this is these guys were thinking about this stuff way before it was really feasible or possible to do with the technology that actually existed. And this is just a cutout from that paper, resolution provided, someday maybe atrial ventricular volumes, who knows, ejection fraction, detections of uh, segmental wall motion abnormality, abnormalities, whether CT will add to or supplant the currently utilized non-invasive techniques such as ultrasonography, what we know as echocardiography or nuclear medicine remains speculative. Not anymore, it doesn't, right? We all know 
right? The amazing, the manifest applications of CT scanning in the cardiac space today. But it's just amazing to me that these guys were thinking about this back in 1977. And I'm so delighted to see Dr. Rittman here today. And uh, Eric probably won't remember uh, giving me some slides or images from a long time ago uh, about, uh, about what was what was came to be known as the Mayo Monster. And I had weirdly, so you, you heard Cynthia said where I came from. I was born and raised in Rochester, Minnesota. I was educated here in medical school. I had never heard of the dynamic spatial reconstructor until I started my fellowship in cardiovascular radiology at Stanford. And it was maybe day three that I worked with Bob Herfkins. And he was like, oh, you're from Mayo Clinic. Then you know the Mayo Monster. I was like, absolutely, I don't. Who are we talking about? No idea who that is. Um, and he talked about the dynamic spatial reconstructor, which of course is a, is somewhat of legend here. And we have, you know, this famous picture, which you've already seen today. And I know that Cynthia has a lot of pictures that I would love to get my hands on that have been rolling in the background about the DSR from back in the day and the, you know, apocryphal, the hole that had to be dug to allow for this, for, for the room that was there. And it was so cool to see the pictures of the entire team that worked on the DSR. And this really just absolutely fascinating technology developed in the late 1970s. And this, of course, and this was mentioned this morning um, about the importance of the fact that this was true volumetric imaging, you know, of a kind that hadn't been seen before. Uh, prior to that time, absolutely magnificent stuff. And I have, this is courtesy, Eric, you didn't give this to me. This was something that you must have loaned to Jerry Breen at some point in the, in the past, right? A model that was made from the DSR data that shows a ventricular motion that was actually able to, to reconstruct the motion of the heart. Ridiculous, right? There was nothing that else that we had, right? That would do this back at the time. This is just a, it's amazing stuff. And it's a, it's a piece of history that, uh, that we obviously at Mayo Clinic are rightly proud of. But the DSR, as it turns out, as so many of these things, we heard talked about this this morning, Norbert, I think maybe you talked about it a little bit in terms of bits of the technology that ended up going down an eddy and then kind of being abandoned and, uh, and the, the technology goes a different way. And we've certainly heard about uh, about how, what some of the impact was of, of various different governmental decisions and about how that influenced the way that CT, uh, CT technology evolved. And of course, the next thing that came along, uh, developed at UCSF and, and taken up, kind of we jumped into this, uh, into this area with both feet uh, here at Mayo Clinic was the electron beam CT. And these are, I'm just pulling these images that, again, this was back in 2006 when I gave this up from Prokop and Galansky, which you can actually see that I was making these on a Xerox machine because you can see the print from the page right behind it. If you look closely enough on there, they're literally making a Xerox copy and then doing the weird cut and paste thing. But to me, what this looks like, right, the electron beam CT is it looks like somebody has made a, a basically a, a, a CT tube enormously huge and then put the patient in there. And you see those tungsten rays. And of course this electron beam could be manipulated so quickly that we we're able to get 270 degrees of that fan angle across there and generate enough of a signal in normal sized patients that you could actually get, uh, get really good image quality again for the day. Mostly used in single slice mode for coronary calcium or multi-slice mode for cine imaging, but if you knew what you were doing, and there were folks here who did, you could administer contrast, be super careful about the way you timed the acquisition, you could perform coronary CT angiography. So this is a coronary, actually it's a set of two different coronary CT angiograms, probably more exact to say cardiac CT angiograms from 1988, right? This is a long time, 12 years before Stefan Achenbach's paper came out, really talking about what we we're gonna end up doing with cardiac CT and coronary CT angiography. And again, if you look really closely and you have uh, Breen and Joel's rude type eyes, you can actually see that this patient has a stenosis in the mid LAD that's probably significant. Again, 1988. So what? I've just graduated from uh, from high school, and uh, and the guys at uh, at Mayo Clinic are are inventing the future that I'm uh, hopefully are going to be at least in some small way involved with. And we heard this, Thomas talked about this today, then what we were initially doing gave Ray way to using that slip ring technology to spiral CT and then very quickly moved through the ranks of multiple rays of detectors. And this became the dominant CT technology. And this is for those of you who care at all about the heart, you know this paper from Stefan Achenbach in 2000, right? Where this was really where he talked about multi-slice 
cardiac CT, coronary CT angiography using a four slice CT scan. And if any of you tried to read these back in the day, oh, they're awful, awful, right? You could get patients down to almost asystole in terms of their heart rate and you could almost get diagnostic quality images. They were not attractive, but, uh, but Dr. Akenbaugh and his colleagues were able to get enough patients together that they were able to do coronary CT angiography. And from there, you know, the kind of the slice wars uh, continued on through about the 64 slice scanner. And the way that I remember it, Cynthia, and maybe this is just me making it up in my mind, but the way I remember it is that the 64 slice scanner arrived here the day that I did, finishing fellowship and coming back on staff. And I remember it, you know, being installed in that funny looking bay back in the CTCIC uh, back in the day. And uh, this was an exciting time. It was a very exciting time for all of us, but certainly for those of us in cardiac CT. So again, I bounced ahead just a little bit, but in my mind, we're still back in 2006 and I'm giving this talk to you about the past, present and future. And I thought, you know, I'm young staff. I'm, I'm gonna take a couple swings here. Let's take a look and I'm gonna do my best to prognosticate the future. And so as, uh, as of course uh, the infamous Yogi Berra has said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And I will just share with you, a couple of mine were okay. I will share with you a couple of my more embarrassing 2006 predictions. This was the first one. Um, many of you probably know Konstantin Nikolaou, who's a, a colleague of ours who's active in the cardiovascular space in the early days. And Konstantin and his colleagues kind of pulled the front off of a CT scanner and took essentially, I think, an X-ray detector and mounted it in a CT scanner and spun it around a patient, but not really a patient, part of a patient that they had infused with, um, with contrast. And they got these at that time in 2005, exquisite images of the coronary arteries. In a cardiac explant that is not beating over about 20 seconds with high density contrast, not something that we could really replicate in the human body. But I said, I was like flat panel CT, you heard it here first, this is coming to cardiac CT. We've learned a lot about that and there are things that are close to flat panel CT, but obviously the technology has gone a different direction. That was number one. I wasn't super on with that one, but that one was a lot closer than this prediction was. I don't know if any of you were, probably many of you were at, at RSNA in 2005, and I don't know, Neurologic, Neuro something, Neurologica something. They had this mobile CT scanner. It was on little treads, like a little caterpillar that you could drive around theoretically, you know, when it worked, which was not all the time anyway, but you could drive the thing back and forth. I was like, portable CT, they make that gantry a little bigger, you hook up some ECG leads and we'll be able to drive this thing all over the hospital. And yeah, no, that never happened. So this was, again, that's, it is hard to make um, predictions, particularly about the future. And those were two of my 2006 swing and a miss. And this was the thing that did happen, right? It, it, we, we know this about the evolution of CT technology. We also know it about the evolution of cardiac CT technology. There is this stepwise change in technology. And we heard this over and over again with this morning's uh, lectures. Clear increments, clear improvements in technology tend to displace other ways. And, and, uh, and there is limited space for parallel technology. Sometimes things develop in parallel and they stay in the market together. And sometimes they end up being eddy currents and then they, they go away. Whether good or not so good technologies doesn't always matter, right? That it's not always the best technology that wins. It's sometimes the one that is appropriate for the time. And I really enjoyed the, the discussion we had this morning about third and fourth generation CT and the arguments about which should win. But it was this, right, that ended up winning, right? There's the dual source CT, at least in my world. This was what changed kind of everything for us. And Cynthia, you remember these days, right? We had a first generation dual source CT, and then we got that first one, was it the 4G, the 3G? I can't remember, the one up on Joseph 6, which was the first dedicated cardiac CT scanner post imatron in the cardiac practice. And of course, you know about how this works and what it does, but I have a cool animation here, so I'm just gonna run it. This is, of course, they mounted, in addition to the A tube and detector array, they mounted the B tube and detector array in, in together, which we, could be used with ECG gating to cut in half or improve by a factor of two, as Cynthia used to tell me is the better way to put that, the spatial resolution of what we're doing. And of course, you think about the challenge of cardiac CT, and this is, a, you know, this is the shutter speed frame rate kind of discussion. And, and the moving race car is a good one, right? Trying to slow down a picture of a moving race car so you can take a picture. But I like the analogy of your three-year-old nephew on Christmas morning, right? 
trying to keep track of that kid and get a good picture without the blurry motion of it. This is a challenge. It's always been a challenge for us in cardiac CT and the game changer, the dual source CT in a single, right, single innovation, doubling our ability to get or cutting in half uh, the amount of time that it took us uh, to acquire an image. I, I think it's important to point out as you look at this graph from left to right, it looks like we were doing great, 250 milliseconds, 200, 160, 84. But I will just point out that between the four 16th and 64 detector CT scanners, the only way we were improving the, the temporal resolution was by speeding up the gantry, right? And there's kind of, as many of our colleagues have found, and uh, there's only kind of so far that you can do that. And beyond that, it becomes very difficult to do. And that's why the dual source CT for, CT, for cardiac CT was such a game changer. And of course, the other thing that you could do, and this came out with the second generation dual source CT, and of course, you guys all know this, is that uh, high pitch scanning without gaps, right? That was the, I remember having discussions in my fellowship with Jeff Rubin and Dominic Fleischman about, uh, about pitches and what they meant for, for scanning. And everything went out the window in the days of the dual source CT, and in particular, the second generation CT second generation dual source CT. So for cardiac CT scanner, this was a game changer because suddenly, whoop, while the, just about that fast, right? While the scan, right in between heartbeats, boom, you could get a flash mode and we could bang through an entire bank of CT scanner. Each one of these, depending on force or flash, the number of milliseconds changes slightly, but the take home is the same, right? If you got the patient's heart rate down to an acceptable level, you could make all the acquisitions of each one of these individual slices to cover the heart within a single systole, with a, within a single end diastole beat. So that as long as you got, for first generation, got the heart rate down around 60 beats per minute, you had plenty of time, 270 milliseconds uh, to work and get um, at least a single phase of the cardiac cycle. ECG triggered, fast scan rotation, high pitch, heart in 0.27 seconds. Pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. And the reason this was important to me, and again, Cynthia knows when that, whatever it was, 3G, 4G scanner went into Joseph 6, everything changed for this group of folks who prior to that in 2006, we had two lines in the schedule. Line of schedule is the way we measure work at Mayo Clinic, right? That's your clinical assignment. How many of them were there? In 2006, there were two. There's one cardiac MR and one cardiac CT scan back then. Decade and a half later now, instead of five physicians, we have 24 physicians who are reading in the cardiovascular division. That's 21 radiologists and three cardiologists, including three at emeritus staff who keep coming back. Terry, you're welcome anytime. And, and keep coming back to read with us because this is something that they enjoy doing. The number of cardiac CT assignments has quintupled, right, from one to five. You'll notice that cardiac MR is still at one, which is fine. They're doing fine. They'll be fine. But it, in terms of what we're doing in cardiac CT, it, it really has, it, it's exploded, and it's been, it's exploded on the backs of the incredible, competent, incredibly competent people we had working in the division, and then also the technology that we had access to, right? And that's what's really changed for us over the past uh, decade and a half. And the two folks down there in the very bottom I have highlighted because there are two new hires, Ava Kazmarek and, uh, and Alan Stope. And I don't think Ava is quite on the schedule yet, but this is what has happened to the division as a result, again, of those two factors. So I'll talk very briefly. Yep, we've got a, we've got a few more minutes. I'll just hit some highlights in terms of what it is that uh, has really kind of fueled this this, um, I won't say revolution, but this evolution of cardiac CT and the expansion in our practice. We'll talk about structural heart disease, probably the single most important uh, development in the advent of my career has been the development and explosion of structural heart disease CT. We'll talk a little bit, not much about fractional flow reserve. I won't talk very much about photon counting CT because Schweitz stole all my slides and, and showed them all already. So I've got nothing left to tell you about that. I'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. Andy Missert's in the audience, and I kind of feel contractually obligated to give him credit for some of the work that he's done. We'll talk a little bit about plaque imaging, which is something that we have been talking about for a long, long time, uh, roughly since about 2003, but I think probably is about here now. I mentioned structural heart disease CT and how this is probably the most significant event in my career in terms of development, a change in what we, what we are doing. There were some early people who were doing work in the cardiac valves, so aortic valve, mitral valve. We're talking about some Europeans, Patam al Qadi, Gudrun Feuchner. There were some people over there doing work. We didn't do much of this work here. We were very focused on in the, in the States on coronary CT angiography. 
but this has really exploded in recent years. TAVR is transcatheter aortic valve replacement planning. TMVR is transcatheter mitral valve. TTVR is transcatheter thoracic valve and left atrial appendage closure. Basically, structural heart disease is any time you stick a catheter in the heart to fix something that's not a coronary artery. It probably falls under the heading of structural heart disease. It's mostly valves is what we're talking about. What we try to do with CT when we're planning, these are catheters. The big hosey thing from the top is a transesophageal echocardiogram probe. And that other thing coming up from the other direction is this catheter. They're going to stop the heart and blow up a valve, a prosthetic valve in the aorta. I remember the first time this was described to me, I was like, ho, ho, ho. You, you stop the heart briefly, you fibrillate it so it's not beating anymore, and then you blow up a prosthesis and hold the balloon across the aortic valve. We're talking about the same aortic valve, right? You, across the aortic valve and you stop all the blood. This sounds like a terrible idea. This has been done over 200,000 times successfully worldwide now, and it is absolutely a part of valvular therapy. Our job in the CT room is to confirm the pathology, which was suggested by other means, to access the access sites and make sure we knew where the catheter is going to come from, and then obtain any necessary guide, data to guide this specific imaging procedure, basically do an imaging dry run so the folks doing the catheter work right don't run into any untoward surprises while they're in the lab. The reason cardiac CT works for this is all the reasons that you've heard, incredibly high spatial resolution, volumetric acquisition, similar to the DSR, multi-plays data, data set, multi-phasic data set, and our ability to visualize both calcification and surgical material, which is incredibly important, incredibly important in assessment of these particular patients. We got a lot of experience in the aortic space. We were feeling, frankly, kind of cocky with regard to the aortic space. And then we moved over to the mitral space. Turns out there's a whole different ball game. The aorta sits very happily in a single plane, right? The annulus of the aorta is a planar surface. You find the bottom point of each one of the, of the aortic sinuses, that three points, like every three points in the universe that aren't on a line, defines a plane. You can very nicely make a planar measurement. It's very straightforward, very simple. The mitral valve is totally messed up by comparison. Shaped like a saddle, moves all wrong and wonky during the cardiac cycle. It's extremely difficult to try to figure out how to measure it. And if you do it wrong, or do it incorrectly, you blow up this. This is a 3D reconstruction from Jay's lab. We've now pretended there is an, uh, there's a valve prosthesis in there, right? This is a three-dimensionally printed one inside of a mitral annular calcification. If you do it incorrectly, you put in a metallic structure and you take a mobile structure, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which normally flops out of the way when the heart beats, and you stick it in place. And if you stick it in place a little too strong, you inhibit flow of blood out of the aorta. Again, sounds like a kind of a crazy thing to do, just like stopping, just like blowing up that balloon in the aortic space. This is why CT is so incredibly important for planning of transcatheter mitral valve repair. This is Tom Foley generated this image, all that white crusty stuff that looks like a coral reef around here. This is all mitral annular calcification and the red things are three individually uh, 3D rendered STL files of different size valves that he has superimposed across that mitral annular calcification looking to try to create the right size. On the far left, try a 29 millimeter valve in the middle, 26 millimeter valve, and on the far right, a 23 millimeter valve. So I know probably not very many of you do this professionally, but I want you to just glance at this for a second. And I'd like to make the case to you that each one of these valves is simultaneously too large for this space and too small for this space, all three sizes. None of them, oh, I can't believe I did that. Okay, none of them fills the space adequately. There are gaps around the outside in every one of these valves. Additionally, there's white stuff, that's the calcium, in the middle, even after the thing's been deployed. These valves are, every one of them's too big and too small at the same time. How to pick this valve so that the patient survives the procedure is a very challenging thing. And that's why, frankly, we need to move beyond simple, I, I wish Jay were here so that I could give him a hard time about this. We need to be, move beyond our simple, the, the straightforward 3D printing, and we need mo more, we need to go develop more sophisticated tools that allow for material properties so that we can identify when a valve gets blown up, what do the tissues around it do? Where did that chunk of calcium go? 
did it sit very nicely in one of the commissures, one of the mitral commissures, or was it pushed through the ventricular surface causing annular rupture? And this is work that uh, Shui Leng has led with the Department of Engineering, looking at what this, is, what this would potentially look like, what the material properties would tell us about where the tissues go when somebody inflates a balloon. Probably something that we need to be doing as we evaluate, uh, evaluate the science in this regard. And uh, I'm, I'm psyched to be working with Shui on some of that stuff. Okay, so we're totally gonna to change directions. And I apologize for spending so much time on structural heart disease, but Cynthia did warn you that I have a subspecialty interest in that. We'll move more quickly through the rest of the, um, the other advances that are currently happening in cardiac CT. CTFFR, does it sound familiar to people? Anybody remember Jeff Rubin, right? Giving a right, talk in Airy Crown Theater back in whatever RSNA that was. We all thought he was totally crazy. This has absolutely come, uh, come into our practice now. Cardiac CT coronary CT angiography has struggled for a long time with the fact that it's very sensitive and it's not very specific, right? We tend to, as Schwab pointed out in his talk earlier, we tend to overcall stenoses. And the hope is that there, we could develop a technique that would help us with that. Additionally, when you think about strict stenoses and the CADRAS classification that Schwai mentioned, stenosis severity is frankly not really well correlated with ischemia, and we should probably have functional assessment prior to revascularization. That's what the FAME trial told us. So this is very highly mathematical stuff. This uh, slide from HeartFlow, which is uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, companies that provides this for a long time was the only one that was FDA approved. And basically you acquire the data set, you send it to them, they render an anatomic model, they perform a lot of computational fluid dynamics, highly mathematical stuff, and they return this heart flow analysis, which can identify stenoses. And that red spot is the downstream effect in the mid left anterior descending coronary artery after a functionally significant stenosis. This data is, is something that uh, is FDA approved now and has been incorporated into multi-society appropriate use criteria as of 2017, can be used to guide revascularization. So the way that we basically use this is patient comes in, they get a coronary CT angiogram, you don't see anything wrong with them, then you do risk factor modification because frankly, all of us could probably have our risk factors modified. If you see coronary atherosclerotic disease, you see plaque but no stenosis, we recommend medical management. And if you see a moderate to severe stenosis on CT, even one of Schwein's really cool photon counting CTs, then that's potentially an indication for an FFR CT to determine functional significance of the stenosis. And if we employ this, this way we can drive better, uh, better therapies, at least that's theoretically the idea. Why I'm not gonna talk about this because you already talked about it and you stole all my good slides, but uh, they were super excited in the cardiovascular space, specifically about the high resolution imaging, the stents and stenosis, and also spectral imaging, specifically the myocardial plaque. You've seen this, these images shown at a different obliquity. This is super cool stuff. I mean, what we can do with the photon counting when it's working and working well is inc absolutely incredible in terms of increased delineation of stent structures, also our evaluation of my the myocardium, whether we're going to end up imaging different types of material or whether we're just going to image different timing. I don't know yet, but you know, hopefully multi, hopefully um, multiple materials. Cause that's what's uh, that's what I think is really cool about looking at in this case, a patient, well, not a patient. I think this was a pig with uh, an inferior myocardial infarction, our colleagues at the NIH with this, um, with this particular image. Okay. So we've talked about structural heart disease, talked about FFR, talked about photon counting CT. Now we're going to move just a little bit into the future. And this is, Andy Missert's world and the and the other folks who work in the AI space. As all of you know, of course, this is obvious to you, but I, I think it's not obvious to all of our clinical colleagues and even our radiology colleagues. Medical images are way more than pictures. They're absolutely data. They're absolutely data. And for us to really take advantage of them moving into the future, we have to be able to harness that data. And how we do that is still absolutely disputed. And I'll just show you this. Everyone knows coronary calcium CT. This is the most widely accepted non-invasive cardiac imaging test to screen for coronary atherosclerotic disease. And it's great. It's a great test. But what about calcification that is seen incidentally on a non-gated chest CT, right? We perform about 19 million, 19 million non-contrast chest CTs in this country. If we could see, and even better, if we could quantify the calcium that's on those individual CT scanners, 
we're talking about getting closer to population health, right? How do we capture these patients and how do we identify this? It's built into the cholesterol guidelines of 2018 and the subsequent guidelines from JCCT that imagers should report out coronary calcium when they see it on a non-gated study. But I don't know, I look at that, it looks like a blur grant, right? It looks like that, you know, that three-year-old nephew, it looks that, like that race car driving by. I don't have tons of confidence that I know how much calcium is there. I know there's a little bit, this patient has coronary atherosclerotic disease, but I don't know really necessarily what to tell them about. What, what should they do about this? Luckily, smart people and, uh, and uh, Dr. Missert's colleagues have developed algorithms that will do this. And we've shown that an AI model, right, for coronary calcium quantification on a non-gated, non-contrast chest CT performs as well as one of our 3D colleagues actually going through and circling with, uh, uh, with a dedicated software, right? So the semi-automated software. So we can quantify this and we can begin to tell people their risk, their event risk, their cardiac event risk based on a chest CT they got to see whether they still have COVID or not. This is different, right? This is opportunistic screening. So it's not so much, can we do this? It becomes more of a question of should we do this? And if we want to do opportunistic screening, how in the world are we gonna communicate with our clinical colleagues this finding that was previously just incidental? And that's, I think this is part of a larger question, which is what are we gonna do with radiomics data and AI data of all types? How are we gonna capture, how are we gonna archive, how are we gonna communicate this data to the appropriate provider so that they don't get inundated, so they don't get overwhelmed with information, but we provide the right information to the right person at the right time to make uh, appropriate health decisions. And this does play very much into our images, uh, into our concept of radiomics and images as data. We know, and I know you know this, right, that there are ways for us to look at the data that we get with CT scanners and actually extract quantitative features that may have prognostic significance. I'm all fine with that. I'm an imager. I'm a radiologist. I love images. The fact that their data is phenomenal from my standpoint. The thing that makes me nervous is that these things that we are quantifying here, right, I can't necessarily see with my eye. And again, as somebody who's trained in imaging, that makes me very uncomfortable, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't embrace it. And this is where plaque imaging is going as well. And there have been radiomics data, uh, radiomic studies about evaluation of plaque data. And of course, you know that fibrous plaque is not as bad. Fatty plaque is a little worse. Calcified plaque probably used to be bad, but it's not so bad now, except as an overall measurement of your the whole thing's clear as mud. Right? But what we do know is that if you have a human being and they evaluate plaques and they just say, that's a scary plaque, that's a not so scary plaque, they can kind of do that, right? They can, they can get close, but there's tremendous overlap in, these, in the two categories, scary plaque and not so scary plaque. It, the, the human's ability to discriminate among scary and not so scary plaque is difficult. It's somewhat limited. We know that if we employ appropriately, employ radiomics features, we can do better. Right, we can move this ROC curve, AUC curve, and we can start to drive towards more accurate diagnosis if we can appropriately standardize and uh, report out these techniques. But again, these are using parameters that are not visible to humans, which me, makes me as an imager very nervous and not skeptical nervous, but uh, QC control kind of nervous, right? I wanna make sure that I am appropriately mining this data and communicating it to the decision maker, makers. And I think we're gonna see more and more, certainly in the cardiovascular space, the role of the imager kind of moving to a data curator, right? Where we are going to be expected to understand where the data is coming from, how it's used, how it's post-processed, and then how it's appropriately communicated. And that is, going to represent a change, right? And I, I just pulled these images, sorry, pulled this um, wording from this paper. I have no idea how, how to pronounce her last name. Jillies, Giles, not quite sure. But I, I think this wording is so good. Collection of high quality data, image data requires sophisticated content expertise to identify and circumscribe with computer assistant and annotate with a standardized and mineable lexicon the volumes of imaging. However, to make high quality data curation a reality, we first have to convince imagers like me, like Norbert Campo, like Terry Bertiska, this is even a good idea in the first place. And it's weird to me 
that that's one of our bars, right? That we have to convince ourselves and our colleagues as imagers that this is important stuff to do. There's no question that it's important and it's gonna be important for the future. It's certainly gonna be important for the future of AI being incorporated into diagnosis and medical decision-making. Okay, so I think, uh, whoop, uh, sorry, Cynthia went over just a little bit, super quick summary. Technological advancement photon counting CT will replace uh, EID as the dominant detector tech in the next decade. These are my bold predictions, Cynthia, that first one's not that bold. Continued growth, structural heart disease and plaque imaging will fuel ongoing growth in cardiovascular CT. There's never been a better time, never been a better time to be a cardiovascular CT imager. And this looming challenger, challenge of data overload, right? Cardiovascular imagers, but I would argue imagers of all types need to evolve become into becoming expert data curators rather than simply looking at pretty pictures and describing what we see. Thank you very much for your attention.